Could I, could I have a little quiet, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Members of the jury, we are now going to have final summations or final arguments by the attorneys. Now, I need to remind you again that what a lawyer says during the course of the trial in opening statement or in final summation is not evidence. Evidence you've heard from the witness stand, from stipulations, or from exhibits that have been uh, introduced during the trial. Listen very carefully to what they say. Since the burden is on the United States government to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, the prosecution has the opportunity to address you first. Then the defendant's attorney will address you. Then the final summation will be done by the prosecution. Suliosi, you may proceed, sir. Mr. Spence, Judge Button, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in the brief time I have to address you, uh, address you in this historic trial, I want to point out what must already be obvious to you, that Lee Harvey Oswald and Lee Harvey Oswald alone is responsible for the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, our young and vigorous leader whose presidency stirred the hopes of millions of Americans for a better world and whose shocking death grieved and anguished an entire nation. But before I summarize that evidence for you against Mr. Oswald, evidence that conclusively proves his guilt beyond all reasonable doubt, I want to discuss several issues with you which the defense has raised during this trial. Several factors make it clear that Kennedy and Connolly were struck by the same bullet. There's absolutely no evidence of the existence of any separate bullet hitting Connolly. With respect to whether or not any shots were fired from the grassy knoll, I want to make the following observations. Firstly, it is perfectly understandable that the witnesses were confused as to the origin of fire. Not only does Dealey Plaza resound with echoes, but here you have a situation of completely unexpected shots over just a matter of a few moments. When you compound all of that with the fact that the witnesses were focusing their attention on the President of the United States driving by, a mesmerizing event for many of them, and the chaos, the hysteria, the bedlam that engulfed the assassination scene, it's remarkable that there was any coherence at all to what they thought they saw and heard. Human observation, notoriously unreliable under even the most optimum situation, has to give way to hard scientific evidence. And we do have indisputable scientific evidence in this case that the bullets which struck President Kennedy came from his rear, not his front. If either of the two bullets that struck President Kennedy came from the front, why weren't there any entrance wounds to the front of the president's body, nor any exit wounds to the rear of his body? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it could be more obvious that there was no gunman at the grassy knoll. No one saw anybody with a rifle in that area. No weapon, nor expended cartridges from a weapon were found there. It didn't happen. With respect to Ruby killing Oswald, the evidence is overwhelming that he was a very emotional man. When we couple the fact that Ruby cared deeply for Kennedy with the fact that he probably thought that he would be viewed as a hero, Ruby's killing of Oswald has all the earmarks of a very personal killing completely devoid of any outside influence. In the short time I have left, I want to summarize the evidence of guilt against Mr. Oswald. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, within minutes of the assassination, a 6.5 millimeter Mannlicher Carcano rifle, serial number C-2766, was found on the sixth floor of the Book Depository Building. Oswald ordered the rifle under the name A. Hedell. We know that. We know from the testimony of Monty Lutz, the firearms expert, that the two large bullet fragments found inside the presidential limousine were parts of a bullet fired from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons. We also know from the firearms people that the three expended cartridge casings found on the floor right beneath that sixth floor window, undoubtedly the same casings that Mr. Norman heard fall from above, were fired in and ejected from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons. So we know, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, we know beyond all doubt that Oswald's rifle was the murder weapon. 
that caused that terrible, terrible spray of brain matter to the front. The worst sight that I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's obvious that Oswald carried that rifle into the building that day in that large brown paper bag. It couldn't be more obvious. As far as Mr. Fraser's testimony about Oswald carrying the bag under his armpit, he conceded. He never paid close attention to just how Oswald was carrying that bag. He didn't have any reason to. At this point, if we had nothing else, nothing else, how much do you need? If we had nothing else. This would be enough to prove Oswald's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. But there's so much more. Let's look at Oswald's conduct. November the 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination, was a Friday. Whenever Oswald would go to visit his wife in Irving, <clears throat> go on a Friday evening, <clears throat> come back on a Monday morning. On the week of the assassination, however, for the very first time, he goes there on a Thursday evening, obviously to get his rifle for the following day. After the assassination, all the other employees of the book depository building return to work. There's a roll call, they're accounted for, not Oswald, he takes off. The only employee who leaves the building. Just 45 minutes after the assassination, out of the 500,000 or so people in Dallas, Lee Harvey Oswald is the one out of those 500,000 500, people who just happens to murder Officer J.D. Tippett. Oswald's responsibility for President Kennedy's assassination explains, explains why he was driven to murder Officer Tippett. The murder bore the signature of a man in desperate flight from some awful deed. What other reason under the moon would he have had to kill Officer Tippett? Normally, ladies and gentlemen, in a murder case, a verdict of guilty brings about a certain measure of justice, obviously a limited amount of justice, but a certain measure of justice for the victim and his or her surviving loved ones. But here, the effect of this assassination went far beyond President Kennedy and his family. This was an enormous offense against the American people. And no justice could ever be achieved. I respectfully ask you to return a swift verdict of guilty against Lee Harvey Oswald, simply because it is the only verdict that is consistent with the evidence, evidence which conclusively proves Oswald's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Giuliosi. Mr. Spence, you may proceed, sir. Thank you. Court, please. Proceed. Mr. Giuliosi. My partner, Eddie, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you. I, um have been doing this a long time. And I have to swear to you something that I think some of you will find hard to believe. And that is that I never start a final argument in a case like this without my belly just going lickety split. And I wonder if I can do my job right. And as I began to think about what I was going to say to you folks this evening, as a matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, I began to wonder what it would be if Lee were here. What would he say to me? Um, I think I know what Lee would say. I think he would say, I'm scared, Mr. Spence. I think he'd say, I, I can't explain a lot of these things. I think he would say, I don't know, I don't know what to do. And I think 
he would look to me for some answers and from, for some reassurance. And maybe I would say to him, Lee, I might say, Lee, you know, when they charge you, uh, that doesn't mean you're guilty in this country. You know, there's got to be 12 good men and true. Find that you're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm going to ask you to do just one thing. Lee, just trust the jury. Now, I want to tell you something else that I might say to Lee under those circumstances. I might say, Lee, you know, in this country we have great rights. This jury, those rights are as important to every member of this jury as they are to you. Because when, when a member of this jury demands that those rights be given to you, they are protecting those rights for themselves. Indeed, the defendant, that's you, Lee, is presumed by the law to be innocent. He has no burden to prove anything. Did you hear that? He has no burden to prove anything. That means that all of the proof has to come from the government. And they have to prove this case to you beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove every element of this case beyond a reasonable doubt. And when there are reasonable doubts that are raised by this evidence, which was my obligation to do, fairly if I could, they must dispel those doubts. Not one of them. Not two of them. Not 17 of them. But the raft of doubts that you have heard in this case have to somehow disappear unanimously in the minds of every one of you. And I need to say something to you that's very important to me. Each one of you have the power individually to say no if one single doubt remains in your mind. You have the right and the responsibility and the duty to have the courage to say no. And I turn to Lee Oswald and I say, Lee Oswald, this jury, this jury is composed of people that have the courage to say no. And that's what I'd say to Lee Oswald in this case. Well, this is a a case in which we have searched for the truth, I will tell you there is only one truth. There is only one truth in this case, and that is the truth that nobody knows the truth. Nobody understands the truth. There is one truth in this case, and that is the closet involved here is locked, still locked. They won't tell us what's in the closet. This man turns to me and suggests to you that I have some obligation to prove something that is in his locked closet. That's the truth that's ultimately involved in this case. Now, I um, would like to talk to you about some very interesting coincidences. Is it just a coincidence that Mrs. Payne was the head of the East-West Committee? A committee at trying to establish relationships purportedly between people in Russia and people in the United States? Is it just a coincidence that the gun that was found purportedly, purportedly in her garage is the gun that killed the president? Is it just a coincidence that a letter was left by her typewriter for everybody to see? 
which said something about a, a, a letter addressed to the Russian embassy and supposedly written by my client. Is it just a coincidence that the job, hear it please, is it just a coincidence that the job that put Lee Harvey Oswald in the bookstore was a job that Mrs. Payne got for him? What about it, Lee? I wish you could tell us. I wish you could explain to us whether those are just coincidences. Please, there are some other coincidences that I'd like to talk to you about. I think about Hosty. Is it just a coincidence that after his death, and just, just a few days after his death, Lee's death, that Mr. Hostie destroys at the, at the direction of the FBI a note that Lee had written to the FBI? What did the note really say? Why was it, st why was it destroyed? I mean, is that all just a coincidence? What are the mathematical probabilities of all of that just occurring in that fashion? You know, is it just a coincidence that the FBI said to Mr. Hofstie to destroy your notes? You know, if I destroyed evidence, this judge found out that I destroyed evidence in this case, if I destroyed one little evidence, you know what would happen to me? I would be in jail. I would be in jail so quick and for so long, and I would never get out of jail. Did it ever strike you funny? that there should be a man who comes into this court and says, we ain't got any brain. I mean, this is America. Uh, this, this is the FBI. This is the National Archives. This is the greatest murder trial in the world. I'll tell you this much, if one of us was charged with murder, and the most important piece of evidence and the whole trial was gone. And it was evidence that we needed to prove our innocence. We needed it to prove our innocence, and it was gone. Not one piece, but piece after piece of evidence that was necessary for us to prove our evidence was gone. What would we say? We would say, what has happened to this country, wouldn't we? We would say, what kind of a procedure is this? We would say, what kind of a judicial system is this? We would say, what's going on with the FBI? We would say, what is going on in this case? I can hear Lee Oswald saying, I'm a patsy. You know, look at Ruby. Now, we've, you know, let's, let's add to the coincidences. Here is Ruby, long associated with the mafia. Here is Ruby, a man uh, who has had years of experience in relationships with the ugliest, vilest, most vicious mafia characters that are known. You saw the chart of how Ruby's telephone calls went, and suddenly they went sky high, skyrocketed to the Mafia characters. Isn't it a coincidence that in room, in the hospital, there was uh, Mr. Ruby again? How comes he appears over and over everywhere? Now, let's look at some other ideas here that I have that I want to talk to you very quickly about. If you were going to pick somebody, in this case, to set up, who would you pick? Would you pick somebody who was poor and lowly, somebody who couldn't defend himself, somebody who had already set himself up? Would, would you do that? Let's ask, uh, let's ask some other questions. If you were going to kill the president and you wanted to escape, would you take... Uh, Three seconds to, or one second to pick up the three shells 
and leave? Was that what you would do? Or would you just leave them there so they could now tie them into the gun? With respect to the hiding of the gun, would you have figured out some place to hide the gun or would you just leave it out there almost in plain sight? Would you have shot the president from the place where you work? I mean, if you're going to shoot somebody, do you go down and plan, plan the shooting so that you do it from your work and you don't have an escape? You can't drive a car? There's nobody to take you out of there? Is that what you would do? Or was he, as he said, a patsy? And so, where is the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald was even there at the bookstore on the sixth floor when the president was shot, much less that he was involved knowingly in any conspiracy to kill our beloved president. Where is the evidence? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I sometimes tell a story in very special cases about an old man and a smart aleck boy and a bird. And this is a very special case. And I want to leave you with this story because it's an important story. It's a story about a smart aleck boy who wanted to show off an old man and to make a fool out of an old man. And the smart aleck boy had a plan as to how he was going to make a fool out of the old man. He'd found a bird out in the, in the wilderness, a little bird that he brought to his, he, he, he had in his hand. And his plan was to go up to the old man and say to the old man, old man, what do I have in my hand? And the wise old man would say, you have a bird, my son. And then the smart aleck boy's plan was to say, but wise old man, is the bird alive or is it dead? And if the old man said the bird is dead, then the smart aleck boy would open his hands and the bird would fly off free into the forest and into the woods. But if the old man said the bird is alive, then the smart aleck boy figured that he would crush it and crush it until all of the life was out of the bird and it was dead. He would open his hands and say, see, wise old man, the bird is dead. And so, and so, the smart aleck boy went to the old man and he said, old man, what do I have in my hands? And the old man said, You have a bird, my son. He said, Old man, is the bird alive or is it dead? And the old man said, The bird is in your hands, my son. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I give you and place into your hands the history of this country and the case of Lee Harvey Oswald. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spence. Well, you say you may proceed, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, defense counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, based on the evidence in this case, Lee Harvey Oswald is as guilty as sin, and there's nothing that Mr. Spence can do about it. I have yet to see the man who can convince 12 reasonable men and women, as you folks are, that black is white and white is black. Mr. Spence, in his argument to you, no more desired to look at the evidence in this case than one would have a desire to look directly into the noonday sun. 
And I can't really blame him because if I were he, I wouldn't want to either. Because there's not one tiny grain of evidence, not, not one microscopic speck of evidence that anyone other than Lee Harvey Oswald was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Mr. Spence did say this. It was kind of a subtle, very clever argument. Um, took me a while to grasp exactly what he was doing. I, I think he said this, and if I misrepresent you, sir, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think he said that Lee Harvey Oswald was the exact type of person to set up as a patsy, or worse to that effect. I'm just paraphrasing him. A Marxist, a defector to Soviet Russia. Actually, he was the exact type of person to murder the president. And my colleague very cleverly turned it around and said he's the exact type of person to make the patsy. Let's take a look at Oswald. Can anyone fail to see how utterly and completely crazy this man here was? Utterly and completely nuts, bonkers? One example among many, and you have to be bonkers to commit a presidential murder. You've got to be crazy, nuts. One example among many, how many Americans, how many people anywhere in the world defect to the Soviet Union? That alone shows how completely and utterly mentally unhinged this man was. Again, the exact type of person to kill the president. Though he may or may not have had any personal dislike for Kennedy, we don't know that. For all we know, maybe he didn't think Kennedy was that bad a person. Everything is relative in life. However, I think one thing is pretty obvious. Kennedy almost undoubtedly would have represented to Oswald the ultimate quintessential representative. That's the key word, representative, of a society for which he had a grinding contempt. On the issue of conspiracy, Mr. Spence <laughs> I'm paraphrasing him. He, he, he certainly didn't say who specifically murdered the president, but he certainly implied to you that it was some nebulous, some powerful group. He never put the hat on anyone. He kept the hat on his table here. I thought he was going to put it on someone's head, but he didn't. Some mysterious group, powerful group, murdered the president and framed Lee Harvey Oswald, but he didn't say who these people were. He did say the CIA covered up here. He said the FBI covered up there. In which case, if the FBI and CIA were covering up, they'd be the ones who murdered the president, right? Why doesn't Mr. Spence come right out and say it? Why doesn't he accuse the CIA and the FBI of murdering the president? There's one thing you can say about Mr. Spence. He's not a shy man. He knows how to exercise his First Amendment freedom of speech. But he doesn't say it because he's very intelligent, very wise. I'll tell you why he doesn't say it. Because he knows that if he said that the FBI murdered the president, or the CIA murdered the president, it would sound downright silly. You'd laugh at him. But even though neither the CIA nor organized crime would have any productive motive whatsoever to kill the president, let's make the unwarranted assumption that they did, that they had such a motive, and let's go on and discuss Mr. Spence's next point about Ruby killing Oswald. Mafia contract killers are always selected with utmost care. I mean, the one chosen to kill Oswald would be everything that Jack Ruby was not. He'd be someone who had a long track record of effectively carrying out uh, murder contracts before for them and would be a precise, unemotional, businesslike, and above all, tight-lipped killer for hire. The whole notion of sophisticated groups uh, getting, like organized crime, U.S. intelligence, getting Jack Ruby of all people to accomplish a job which, if he talked, would prove fatal to their existence is just downright laughable. When Mr. Spence argued that Oswald was just a patsy and was framed, he conveniently neglected to be specific. How was Lee Harvey Oswald framed? When we look at the mechanics of such a possible conspiracy in this case, how could he have been framed? Let's get into the mechanics. Who was this other gunman who on the day of the assassination made his way into the book depository building, carrying a rifle, went up to the sixth floor, shot and killed the president, made his way back down to the first floor, floor and escaped without leaving a trace? 
how, in fact, if Oswald were innocent, did they get Oswald within 45 minutes of the assassination to murder Officer Tippett? Or was he framed for that murder, too? Mr. Spence can't have it both ways. If the people who set Oswald up were so sophisticated to come up with this incredible, elaborate conspiracy, I mean, to the point they had people, according to Mr. Spence, who can superimpose this man's head on someone else's body. And imposters down in Mexico City. If they were that bright, why weren't they intelligent enough to know the most obvious thing of all? That you don't attempt to frame a man of questionable marksmanship ability who possesses a $19 mail order rifle. As surely as I am standing here, as surely as night follows day, Lee Harvey Oswald, acting alone, is responsible for the murder of President John F. Kennedy. You are 12 reasonable men and women, and that is why I have every confidence that you will confirm this fact for the pages of history by your verdict of guilty. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Members of the jury, now that you've heard all of the evidence in the case, as well as the final arguments and summations by the lawyers, it becomes my duty to instruct you on the rules of law that you must follow in arriving at your decision in this case. The indictment is not evidence of guilt. Indeed, the defendant is presumed by the law to be not guilty. He has no burden to prove anything. The United States government has the burden of proving the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And if it fails to do so, you must acquit the defendant. I caution you, members of the jury, that you're here to determine whether the accused is guilty or not guilty from the evidence in this case and nothing else. Now, the law, as I just mentioned, says that 12 of you will consider your verdict. There are 14 of you in the box. The two alternates, Mrs. Boscope and Mr. Mullins, let me thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, and I know I speak for uh, counsel and other members of the court, uh, you'll be excused, uh, and the 12 of you uh, will begin your deliberations. And with that, we'll stand in recess, awaiting the jury determination. Thank you. We'll stand in recess. Please rise. Court will stand in recess, awaiting the jury's determination. Please rise. You may be seated. I have a note here which reads as follows, Your Honor, we have reached a unanimous verdict dated November 22, 1986, signed Jack Morgan, four person. Mr. Morgan, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. If you would, please, if you'd just hand it to the marshal. You may be seated. Right, Counsel, if you would please, if you'd please stand. I'll ask Mr. Nelson, if he would, to please read the verdict. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Lee Harvey Oswald, guilty of the offense charged in one of the indictment.
After returning a verdict of guilty, the jury was asked to consider whether Oswald had acted alone or with others. The majority concluded that he was the sole assassin. <laughs>